I'm happy to say that I, I was able to um, be involved in the first commercial application of conjoint analysis. And I was doing a little work for a local company, a little consulting for them. And the Bissell Company, the maker of carpet sweepers and so on, came to this firm and they asked them, we had heard a little bit about conjoint analysis, but we're not really sure what it's all about. Do you think you could probably do a project? And the, the person at that, that point said, well, we have this, this guy, Green, over in, at, at Wharton. Maybe he can help out. And they said, well, uh, he said to the, the Bissell people, well, what's it about? They said, well, we have uh, developed uh, a new kind of, kind of carpet spot cleaner. And we're interested in developing the appropriate package or vehicle for delivering the spray because it also has a functional part in which you spray the stuff on and then there's a kind of a package that enables you to ruffle up the, uh, the carpet itself to help get out the spot. So we're interested in what that package should look like. We have various designers who've come up with possibilities. We're interested, of course, in the, in the Bissell name. I mean, if suppose it were Glory or some other spot removing company, how good are we in that kind of competitive context? But not only that, we're interested, uh, let's say, in the price of what this particular product would be. And besides all of that, we're interested in um, whether it has the good housekeeping seal of approval. So they could go on and on and on. So by and large, if you just had, say, three ver versions of package, three versions of, let's say, price, and three versions of maybe some other attribute, it rapidly multiplies. But the, the advantage being that once we do this with these uh, experimental designs that can give people, in this particular case, perhaps as few as only nine evaluations to make, we can infer from the mathematics what this could be for perhaps 27 or even 81. Uh, these were just typically three-level type designs. So that was the very, very first project. And my colleague, uh, uh, Jerry Wind, and I uh, worked on this. Bissell liked it because they got multiple answers, not only to tell them something about package, it told them something about price, talked something about um, brand, and something about the value of the good housekeeping seal of approval. So they got all of this information effectively from one particular study. So we, we kept that in the back of our minds when I say we, Jerry Wood, my longtime colleague and I. And for the fun of it, I said to Jerry one day, I said, look, we've never published anything in uh, the Harvard Business Review, which is viewed uh, by snobs, at least, as you know, just a, sort of a, a, a basic, uh, uh, not really high scientific journal. I said, just for fun, let's take this example try to write like a Harvard Business Review writer would do. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we set this up. We had little vignettes and so on, and little set-asides and, and like. And we tried our best to emulate, to imitate that kind of style of writing. And lo and behold, it was accepted. And it sold more reprints than any other thing I've ever done in my life, which gives you some idea of how off-base we were in terms of the, you know, the value of even these simple kinds of studies. It turns out in about 1975 that um, AT&T became very much interested in the idea of a mobile telephone that could operate in a kind of honeycomb type system where there were signals sent out by a series of signal generators so that at any given time, uh, as a car was rolling along in this area, they would be receiving some kind of a signal, and then they would move to the next station and so on. It was, they referred to it as a honeycomb system. And when they talked to us about it, and also to another colleague of mine who was then working at AT&T, uh, Doug Carroll, we set up a study team to examine the audience reaction, if you will, or people's reaction to this new kind of system. And in this particular case, we were fortunate 
that they had actual prototypes as opposed to concepts. And they were able to install on a random sample in Chicago where the study was done, a thousand units with people who had agreed to participate in that study and participate also in some a series of surveys that were made, including one from us. So the idea was that they were to get this equipment and to use it free uh, in the particular car of the, that they happened to be driving and to participate, of course, uh, in the questioning that would be associated therewith. So we started out and tried to examine uh, the kinds of characteristics or attributes that would be important. Certainly the reception side would be, maybe even the dial tone would have some kind of effect. Uh, certainly the pricing of it, uh, the, the extent to which the information that would come through would be free of static. So we ended up with a, something on the order of eight or nine attributes that could reflect how people would react to the use of this system, including, of course, uh, the price of it and the, the method of payment. So th the cars were then equipped, and we, over a period of waves, made several studies over that period to find out how people would react to this. And uh, this study was, uh, as I say, a, a good one in the sense that we did have an actual prototype. And from that came, uh, indeed, the first mobile telephone. And most of the recommendations that the study came up with in terms of pricing, reception, and so on, were addressed in the actual prototype, or beyond prototype, that went out after this initial stu study was uh, completed. So that was a kind of an exciting one in the sense that we were able not only to make uh, kinds of predictions as to what would happen, but had the actual prototype, which is usually unusual in the case of uh, working with conjoint studies. The second study, I guess, has received the most attention uh, of all the ones that we have done over the years, and that's the celebrated uh, Marriott uh, Courtyard Hotel, which entailed a brand new concept of having a hotel that would cater, let's say, in many cases to the, uh, the businessman, but the businessman who was not interested in a high frills, a very expensive type of hotel, but would be serviceable, would have all of the accoutrements that they needed, and yet would not compete highly with, let's say, the Marriott hotels which themselves, of course, were quite expensive, but also very lush in comparison. So what should that hotel look like? Now, in, trying, in sitting uh, down with management and going over these kinds of things, and we had a large study group from the Marriott Corporation involved in this. So if, uh, as a digression, I might say one of the best things that one can do in implementing these projects is to make sure that management is involved from the beginning so that they, they uh, develop on their own a kind of a connection with the operation. So here we were faced with the problem of just a surfeit of attributes. We ended up with 50 of them that could be grouped into various things, dealing with exterior, dealing with rooms, security, the lounge, the exercise area, the pool area, all of which were part of the hotel itself but had separately set up attributes that reflected their particular characteristics. Then we had to meld the whole thing together at the very end because a person is essentially buying a room with all of the, uh, the things that would go along with that particular room. And we were, of course, interested in the share of nights, which was the type of response measure we got from them. So people went through a series of exercises um, they were done in conjunction um, with a, a layout that was experimentally manipulable. We were able, with uh, Marriott's help, to get a bank of rooms that we could keep changing according to these experimental designs. The layout of the furniture, what amenities were in the bathroom, uh, the actual size of the room itself, and so on. These being experimental layouts that people could go in and evaluate. And that helped a lot to add to the realism of the project. So effectively, what we did was to 
come up with a sample of about 600 people, which was comprised largely of people interested in a no-frills type of hotel, or in some cases vacationing type people as well. And the idea was not only to come up with what that hotel should look like and what amenities it should offer, but where it should be located, how it might attract or detract from competitive hotels in that area that were part of that competitive system. Since this hotel concept now would be lower than their Marriott so as to reduce cannibalization and um, high enough that they can make money on compared and attractive enough to the lower end hotels like the, in that case the Ramada and Holiday Inn. So it was put in in that purposeful way to draw more new business that it would lose through cannibalization from the Marriott's. And it was a smashing success, it turned out, that uh, we came in and were um, in a national competition of projects. These were of all kinds in this area of operations research that I had talked about. Uh, we were one of the ten finalists, and we ended up with second prize. Now, the reason why we ended up with second prize was quite simple. The first prize winner constituted a uh, triage arrangement in San Francisco that enabled uh, uh, help on the way people to get at various places and back to the nearest areas in some small fraction of the time that existed prior there too. Uh, the, I guess it was Feinberg, uh, they sent a, a, a videotape of her uh, loading the system. They had a four-star general type chief of police who came in and, and loaded the praises of this. So we looked at each other, we knew we were completely out of it. We were trying to rent rooms and they were saving lives. So we came in second. But in any case, that was a little, little vignette. But that was probably the most complex project that I've ever worked on with, with my colleagues. And I haven't seen anything to top it in terms of just the sheer uh, minutia that were associated with uh, pulling this off. It started then in, we started the project in, 1982, uh, roughly, uh, the, they started some hotels embodying this concept, uh, and I think at the end of 90, something about 96 or something, they had uh, something on the order of over 100 courtyards. I just checked a while back on the internet, they now have 450 courtyards scattered throughout the U.S. and Europe actually throughout the U.S. and the rest of the world. So it was a high-profile type of project. Uh, that, in a sense, had to start with, as I say, concepts, pictures, some cases real furniture they could see and so on, but a lot of it was conceptual as opposed to the, to the case involving the first uh, mobile telephone. The third project that I would view as different from the usual crowd was the uh, project called the Easy Pass system, where we were approached, and this was in the beginning of the 90s, by a market research firm that we had worked with. And it turned out that the New York and New Jersey travel authorities were very much interested in developing a type of system that would do away with uh, payment of coins or transfers or things of this sort by having transponders, uh, little electronic devices that could be set up in the car window or the, on the car dash that essentially would emit a signal which would be picked up by antennas in the ten tunnels or the bridges or the turnstiles and so on so that a car would ne not need to stop. They could go by, let's say, something on the order of 20 miles an hour, and effectively everything would be debited electronically. They would pay for this uh, system in terms of something akin to a debit card. They would pay so much per month, that would be automatically deducted. So the whole idea was how to take a concept of this idea that's quite radical and to both collect information about people's preferences, a la conjoint analysis, 
but in the same breath, educate them about it. So enter the idea of a videotape where uh, the people that were shown this, and the sample size was in the order of 6,000, was a huge group that was set up uh, geographically in the area of primarily of New Jersey and New York. So people received in the mail a little uh, box, and the box was colorfully decorated and so on. In that box was a videotape, and the videotape was surrounded by all the necessary materials they needed to go through the exercise of giving us their idea of various sorts of trade-offs. So it was self-contained. And the very th first thing they were asked to do was to play the tape on their machine. So that was a qualification, of course, to receive it. After seeing this, uh, something like a six-minute or so information, informational, um, information commercial, they were asked to go through the easy part of the exercise, which consisted of some self-administered questions that they could easily answer. And then they were given a hotline that they could call at their leisure, or they could be called by the, uh, the central interviewer who would go through the more difficult parts of the question with them. And all, as I say, all the materials were done in this compact fashion. So uh, it came through, we were able to set up uh, about seven different regions, all of which had their own particular kinds of configurations. So it was not a completely homogeneous kind of exercise because of the differences in the, the nature of the authority involved and the particular facility on which it was used. And it started in with a certain amount of trepidation. I remember getting the first feedback and there's the usual foul-ups and something doesn't work when it's supposed to and so on. But then it became a, a resounding success in New Jersey. And I like to say, I think we put it in an article, even De David Letterman said he liked the system. He said it was one of the few good things ever done in, in New York. That has now, since, um, in a sense, it's been expanded in, to parts of Pennsylvania. So uh, what we were able to do was, again, to go through the characteristics of the system, which had to do with how many aisles that you had that are pass-through aisles uh, had to do with, of course, pricing, uh, not only how much you would pay for it, but how you would pay for it in terms of a credit card or something of that sort. It had to do with other possible uses for the card and uh, five or six other ones that had dealt with aspects of actually embracing the service and seeing how it would work. So that did get a lot of publicity. And uh, as, as I say, it's been expanded to, to operations now in Pennsylvania. And we're not quite sure where it's going to end, but uh, it's now a viable operation. And we had predicted um, at the time the study was done that maybe as high as 45% uh, of, the, of the public would opt for this, would switch over from their usual system. And like many of these things, the steering committee that was backing this whole thing got very, very frightened that maybe we're overstating the case. They wanted a very conservative estimate, so we went out and collected additional information using other methods, and that supported this number roughly 45 to 50 percent. And somehow or other, they, they stuck with it. The system went into effect. And something like seven years later, it was, I think, just about 50% and heading actually a little over 50%. So it was one of the nice things where we had a long-term prediction and we got very lucky. But it does point out the notion that people tend to be conservative when there are very, very large stakes involved and when the concept is a very new one. Often when we do studies involving conjoint analysis, we need different but compatible sources of information that involve different data collection so that when we meld the, all of them together, each is contributing an important part. When we did the EasyPass system, for example, people were asked to look and focus on an easy question relatively, namely how many lanes for, for EasyPass should it have, and they would indicate how desirable each of these alternatives would be. And then they would go to the next attribute again and just focus on it, worry about the, how attractive its levels were, and to rate them. 
Having done all of that, then they were asked to look at the attribute names themselves, like one would be a use of cart elsewhere as opposed to, let's say, using an easy pass. And that involves a still another uh, but fairly focused uh, idea of typically spreading 100 points to reflect the relative uh, importance of these attributes whose levels they had just evaluated. Finally, because of certain possible biases in some of the inputs, particularly from the desirabilities or importances, um, they put everything together, which is the hardest task, because here now we have the possibility of, of looking at a complete profile as opposed to things piecemeal. And these once-over-lightly once techniques don't do well at that, but the conjoint part does. The conjoint part does, that third part does, uh, not as well as these individualized uh, procedures do because their focus is much narrower. Put the three together, they compensate for each other. The fourth project, which is actually ongoing right now in terms of its, uh, not the work that we did, but in terms of its rolling out, what we would call rollout period, concerns a local company called uh, Mobility Technologies. They're located right out in Wayne, Pennsylvania. They were clever. They heard about the development of a system involving computers in Washington that would enable uh, people to get signals in terms of traffic conditions uh, in which you could get not only what routes are travel, what, what your elapsed time would be, where there are construction areas, alternative routes. You could be, you could get this in general uh, through the internet, through a, a, a mobile uh, a cordless phone, or you could get it through a, 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 a type of handheld device, some, a, some kind of a, uh, an agent, an active agent. If any of these uh, feasibilities existed with this uh, type of system. So this again involved a, a case where we had to uh, acquaint the people with the nature of this new concept, how it would affect their behavior patterns, the advantages, the possible disadvantages, and so on. All in the process of doing that before they actually entered into the questionnaire. And this became fairly complex because you could have all of these various options, each at different prices, depending on how um, much you were going to use the phone, the nature of the way you were going to be using it, and things of that sort. So they went through these exercises, and we used Pittsburgh as a test city. There were five malls there, and people were contacted in these malls that then were taken through rather extensive uh, uh, battery of, of exercises involving the conjoint study. And then, of course, they were paid for their, for their time and effort. It started operation then, um, I guess, maybe about a year or so ago. And um, as I say, they're located right out in, in the Wayne area. And from what I understand, things are moving quite along quite nicely. One of the things that came out of this from a scientific standpoint was the ability to go well beyond the usual kinds of results where you usually say, well, our overall penetration is going to be uh, 40% if indeed we price it at this amount. As opposed to saying, well, there's some people here who would prefer or at least be willing to accept a price level of such and such, while others not so. So we're able to go into the marketplace with an optimizer that first of all found the best system that you could develop if you had to show the same system and sell the same system to everybody. That's the usual way these things get done. But then we said, maybe we can capitalize on making things a bit more attractive to people by first clustering the data, because there are people out there who want different kinds of systems. And maybe if we optimize within each of the segments that we get, the overall revenue that we'll get, not only satisfying the people for what they want, will be higher. And indeed, we did. So we're able to do that. And then we said, well, why stop here? Why not go for a segment of one? So the, the, the mathematics and the computer 
speeds now are such that you could actually go in and optimize for a single individual. Now, this assumes in some sense their willingness to pay, and uh, it may, of course, very well uh, expose itself to problems in terms of uh, uh, differential prices for different people, so there's a legal kind of question. But at least from the standpoint of the mathematics of it and the ability to simulate and optimize, in theory and in, in principle, you can uh, do this for each individual at once. And they couldn't have a possibly different configuration at a different price. And then you could amalgamate up from there. But, of course, you have to locate those individuals. So we were able to get some additional data that indicated the type of people who were really gung-ho with the system and that those would probably be the ones that they would find attractive to go with first. And then after that particular wave, then move to the second wave and so on in terms of proclivities to uh, try the new system. Well, the Coca-Cola study that I referred to uh, briefly is a, involving a different type of technique. This is a multidimensional scaling technique rather than conjoint analysis. And it very often happens that uh, companies like Coca-Cola are interested in, in developing new advertising, in some cases new slogans. In this particular case it was what kind of slogan that we can we get that we know will be really related to how people perceive Coca-Cola to be vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, its various rivals, Pepsi or Royal Crown or even 7-Up or whatever. Typically, the way that's done is that uh, they, the company would contact a variety of ad agencies and ask them to you know, come up with sort of top-of-the-head views of what, what that uh, should be, that slogan. This particular project, Coca-Cola did it a bit differently. They still contacted several agencies but they asked them to come up not with a single one, but with a group of, uh, in other words, four or five possible slogans. And also, um, the Coke people knew at this point what the competing uh, drinks would be. So they wanted to be careful about picking a slogan that actually might benefit a competitor, as opposed to, let's say, the one that would really be close to Coke. They set up, a, with our help and our analysis, they set up an experiment, which a large number of people came in. They saw actual replicas of the bottles of all of the drinks. And uh, they then saw various kinds of uh, descriptions of these in terms of, you know, how this particular slogan, let's say, this matched this particular idea. So. They were given cards, each one containing a slogan. There was something like, I think of roughly about 10 drinks and maybe 15 or 20 slogans. And for each drink, they were asked to sort through the slogans and pick uh, those that they think are best describe that particular drink. Just, as, just what we call a pick K out of N. In other words, K could be three out of the 15 or it could be six or whatever. Uh, and then they indicate, in terms of their perceptions at least, as they think about Coca-Cola or Royal Crown or what have you, that these are closer to their, their view of its presence and its, its sort of core being. So you, you get a big matrix, a uh, big table, in which you have, at, at any individual level, you have the one, you get a one if you pick it and a zero if you don't for that particular drink and that particular set of slogans. But when you aggregate, let's say, across people, you now start now to get frequencies across people who sort of share views one from the other in terms of this. So you end up with a numerical matrix, or just a table, that on the rows would have, let's say, the, uh, the soft drinks and then you would have, the, let's say, the 20 slogans on the right, and then you would have the frequency with which each slogan was matched with each of the brands. And when you look at that, it may not tell you much, but when you go into one of these multidimensional scaling programs, 
it converts that numerical information into a picture. And it shows you in what we call a joint space map, a multidimensional scaling map, the positioning of all, of, let's say, the 15 uh, colas and all of the 20 slogans. So you could find out at this particular case which slogans are really viewed in this population to be closer to Coke and which might favor another particular uh, brand. It turned out that some of those slogans would have favored Pepsi-Cola much more so than Coke. And the interesting thing that came out of it was it's the real thing. And this was used, I'm sure, as part of a much bigger parcel, uh, but was used in the development of that uh, slogan at that particular time. So this is called Pick K Out of N Data, and the nature of the technique is multidimensional scaling. The Life Serial Project um, is an interesting one, also involving multidimensional scaling. Uh, it turned out that Life Serial was one of a set of perhaps six cereals that had a lot of vitamins and minerals and so on, total and others being uh, that kind of thing. And um, uh, there were the, in terms of the Life Serial, the, uh, I'm, I better close on this one. Uh, I want to get this particular straight quiz. Um, um, Tell us about it. Uh, one of the, uh, the useful applications area for multidimensional scaling is examining advertising. And in this particular case, uh, Life Serial uh, was coming out with a series of ads that were effectively just looking at the nutrients of that cereal, not spending much time about uh, the questions of who it might relate to and that kind of thing. There was a feeling on the part of the ad agencies that maybe they should change their advertising, that maybe they should get into more humanistic kinds of things. One nice thing about Life Serial was that it uh, both uh, could be made and was being then made a bit sweeter, which would have more appeal to kids, but was still chock full of all these goodness things. So they came upon a simple and a rather effective idea. They said, look, we're going to change our advertising now. We want you to, first of all, go out in the marketplace and, and give us a map, a multidimensional scaling map, that tells us where life serial is right now. Is it going to be smack in the middle of the, you know, the hype? Uh, nutrient type cereals or it's going to be with the kids cereals. It turned out it was kind of in between. It was on the periphery of the so-called nutritious type cereals that would be associated with adults, but not quite in the kids cereals. And there's something like 50 cereals, so this was a big map in which we were interested in sort of two areas of that, the kids section, of course, and then in this particular case, the, uh, the section dealing with these highly nutritious cereals. So they set up a campaign. We had the starting map as to what the market is right now and sort of how people perceive uh, life to be there. And uh, the idea now was to modify this kind of idea and to introduce various celebrities. So they had Casey Stengel, for example. That goes way, way back. And there would be a little kid you know, tugging at his sleeve because he would say how nutritious and marvelous this was, but the kid would say that it tastes well. Or they had um, Jimmy Durante. He was another oldster. They got a whole series of these oldsters that were identified as either sports figures typically or entertainers. And they all had the same kind of tagline where the kid said, but it tasted good. And the interesting thing was that my colleagues and I tracked this as it started initially and carried it through nine months. And of course, we were reporting how these maps were changing. And as they changed, you could actually, as the campaign wore on, you could see what was actually happening in, happening in the maps that we were taking with new samples, fresh samples of people, and to the point where it actually started moving into the, the kids' cereal line, which is sort of where they wanted it in part to be at least on the periphery of that as opposed to being closer to the highly nutritious cereals. And this, of course, elated them that 
at least the advertising was uh, being effective. And they moved into that and sort of kept that campaign going, as I recall, for another fairly substantial period. This was the case then of tracking and using uh, these kinds of devices as a measurement tool to see how well a particular campaign is going. This is an interesting one because it involves cluster analysis as the technique as opposed to multidimensional scaling or conjoint analysis. AT&T at that time hired a, an agency, a national analysts, right here in Philadelphia, and we worked with them. And they were interested in developing a campaign that was emotionally oriented, that in some sense, since they knew that the penetration rate of telephones was on the order of 95 or more percent, the idea was to get people to use long distance, let's say, um, more frequently than not. So the idea was to set up uh, a fairly large-scale survey in which we would go around in the beginning part of collecting the data. Uh, we would go around collecting information from people before we applied cluster analysis on the following kind of idea. Think about the last time you used long distance. And, you know, assuming it's a, a, a fairly recent time they could do this. Do you remember the circumstances that prompted you to either receive that call or post that call? In other words, make that call, and these were sort of subdivided. So people would give us a narrative. Well, uh, it turned out that my son just graduated from college, and he, he got uh, an extra a couple of awards for that, so he wanted to call me, and here we've talked about that. Or I, I found out that by... Um, my niece, for example, just had a baby and I was called there, or I decided to call my niece and congratulate her and so on. These were all, all these little vignettes, and there were many, many of them, were uh, collected from a large sample of people, all dealing with their report, however flawed it might be of what they were doing and how they reacted and what the nature of it was, particularly the nature of the, the call, the content of the call. These were then categorized in terms of a series of adjectives, you know, dealing with pathos, dealing with uh, uh, pecuniary uh, needs and things of that sort. And we developed a kind of a taxonomy of these so that we were able now to develop a classification type of system using clustering, which I've talked about uh, earlier, and find out if we could develop maybe a set of, of 15 or 20 different vignettes that would be uh, poignant, uh, that would sort of relate to the importance of a particular call. You know, in other words, to make a long distance call, it should be important and which would strike people from an emotional standpoint. Because what we want to avoid, of course, is wear out. If we have this campaign, we don't want to try to give them the same commercial involving the same situation of, this, of the soldier reporting back to his uncle or that sort of thing. So it was something in the order of 15 or 20 of these that were set up, and I think we know down to about 15. Each was then uh, the, the core of it, was then actually turned in by creative people into an actual situation in which you have a person on the phone making a call, and, they, and then you usually get the, the person on the other end, whether it's the soldier to the father or vice versa. And these then had all this emotional impact, and they had the value of sort of tapping off in real terms what really happened to people in terms of roughly the frequency with which these kinds of calls occurred. And they were able to get a huge uh, uh, fill up out of this, primarily because they had so many that they could revolve through that the person hadn't said, well, I've seen that, you know, three days ago. So it was a long campaign, and it was a very wide campaign in the sense that they had everything tied under this umbrella of uh, emotional appeal. There are a number of areas outside of the usual marketing of products and services 
in which these techniques have been used. For example, they might be used in it, a non-profit kinds of institutions that have maybe certain kinds of advertising campaigns that they would like. Uh, it might be used in a variety of sporting type events in which you're interested in uh, various kinds of uh, configurations of teams and the like. It's used a lot in the area of uh, legal disputes uh, in which uh, you're trying to look at the what would have happened, what would you have predicted the profit, let's say, of a company to have been had its adversary engaged legally and, and without problems as opposed to what it actually got. So you have to go back and some cases in point, we did a project just recently for the Ravens uh, football team, just how valuable is the logo that uh, they have there, which they could put on sweaters and, and T-shirts and the like. Um, one was done, in fact, it was a high profile case involving a fellow who had invented a, the intermittent windshield wiper and he sued all of the, I guess it was the big five automobile makers and got something like 90 million dollars or something of that sort. And the idea was to find out how much he should be paid. So a study was done to examine the value of this one little feature uh, in uh, the, the overall makeup of a car. So it's, the, legal, the legal field is very rife with uh, applications. Jerry Wynn, my colleague, uh, specializes in that area.